Good evening, friends and colleagues. Good evening, Ando lovers. Tonight, we are on our second webinar of the Lebanese Society of Endodontology. This webinar is one of the series leading to our Congress in 3 and 4 June, 3, 4 June, 2022. The webinar tonight is exceptional because our lecturer is exceptional. Our lecturer is Ghassan Yared, and who doesn't know Ghassan Yared? Ghassan Yared is the king of simplifying because he simplified our shaping techniques by reducing a system to one file. And tonight we will, we will simplify our chronic problem of anesthesia of lower molar in case of irreversible pulpitis and in case of the chronic pain when we do a lot of things until intraosseous anesthesia. I will leave the stage to our uh, scientific chair, Dr. Carlos Gheib, to introduce Professor Hassan Yared, who will later on talk about the anesthesia. Good evening. Professor, I have the pl pleasure to introduce you tonight. Professor Hassan Yared completed his endodontic training at Université Paris 7. He has been extensively involved in teaching. He was head of the Department of Endodontics at the uh, University of Toronto. Professor Yared has supervised the research projects of graduate endodontic students in Toronto and has published extensively in peer-reviewed international endodontic journals. He has practiced, practiced endodontics exclusively in Canada for 20, 20 years, and lately he came back to Lebanon. Professor Yared is the inventor of single file endodontics and mechanical recipro reciprocation. He introduced a new concept for the management of root canals when a, with a non-instrumentation technique. This evening, he will be giving us a briefing about a successful anesthesia on lower molar with irreversible pulpitis. Please go ahead, Professor Hassan. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh... And thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Rizzi, for the introduction. Uh, I thank the uh, Lebanese Society of Endodontology for the invitation to give this webinar. And I thank all the attendees. Today, I'm not going to talk about uh, reciprocation. I'm not going to talk about uh, canal preparation. I'm going to talk about a specific topic, topic the, the pulpal anesthesia in, case, uh, in cases of molars with acute irreversible pulpitis. So those are, those are articles that were published on the success rate of pulpal anesthesia in molars with acute irreversible pulpitis, or what we also call symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. There are more than 100 articles published on this topic, and specifically on mandibular molars. All of these articles showed that the success rate of pulpal anesthesia in these cases is quite low. So we have a patient who comes to our office in pain, severe pain due to a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. You know, this patient is already very anxious and, and fearful. And we know that anxiety affects pain, affects pain during a procedure and affects pain postoperatively. So this is something we really have to consider when we manage these patients, patients who are presenting again for an emergency treatment because of a, uh, of a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. So we have the patient uh, coming to our office in severe pain. We anesthetize the patient. We give one block, uh, one inferior alveolar nerve block or two blocks, and we give supplemental anesthesia. And then the patient is very numb, lip is very numb, wait 10, 15 minutes, 
patient has been relieved from the pain because of the anesthesia. And then we hold our heart in our hands because we are about to start the procedure, not knowing whether the patient will feel something or not. We start the excess cavity, then two minutes later, the patient jumps in pain. That is already a failure of the anesthesia. This is our failure. Don't forget that these patients are already very anxious. When we anesthetize them, they feel some relief. We, in a way, establish you know, trust between us and them. Then we do the excess cavity. They feel pain. This trust is broken then these patients will be more sensitive to pain. This is what research has done. And that's why I put uh, these uh, articles here, these references. So the patient feels pain, we stop, patient jumps, we give additional anesthesia, supplemental anesthesia, whether it is intraligamentary or intraosseous anesthesia. And we do not know whether the patient you know, will, will feel anything when we, when we continue. So we continue, we tell the patient, five minutes and everything will be all right. Five minutes for this patient is a lifetime. We continue, continue, and then maybe the patient will feel pain again. More anxiety, which means most likely the pain that is felt by the patient will be increased. We stop, we tell the patient, two minutes and will we'll be done. And we aim then to do the painful intrapulpal injection. We inject and the patient jumps and here we're done. The patient is not happy, we're not happy, we're very stressed. If you are an endodontist, the patient goes back to, uh, to the referring dentist, will tell them, I'm not happy. I felt severe pain while having the root canal treatments. So studies have shown that the success rate uh, in mandibular molars with acute irreversible palpitis is, is very low. But in addition, all of the articles on this topic mention the following. This is how they define anesthesia success. Anesthesia success means no pain or minimum pain during needle insertion, during injection of the anesthetic solution, and during the treatment procedure. And this has been also mentioned in this latest article uh, that was you know, just published. This is a very good uh, article to read because it contains all, the, all of the references on this topic if you need to, to look at them. So what surprised me is that What surprised me is that they consider that the presence of minimum pain uh, does not mean that there is failure, but that is included in the anesthesia success. I can tell you, if I were to have an emergency treatment for a symptomatic irreversible palpitis, I do not want to feel any pain at all. So minimum pain should not be included in the definition of anesthesia success. And this definition, you will see it in every article on this topic. And also in articles by, by very famous researchers who publish on this topic exhaustively. So this should be taken out from the definition of anesthesia success. In addition, the articles, many articles say supplemental injections do not always produce pulp anesthesia. Therefore, intrapulp anesthesia is indicated. So I say here, no, no, and no. We should not do an intrapulp anesthesia. If we get to the point where we're doing an intrapulp anesthesia, that means we failed in our task relieving pain relieving the patient from, from, uh, from their pain. 
in the 21st century, we should not subject the patient to pain that is caused by an intrapulpal injection. And the CESA success means, and this is my definition, is that you can promise the patient that there will be no pain. And this is what I do in my office. I promise the patient that there will be no pain. Just by promising them and you know, being confident when you promise them, you already establish a trust relationship with the patient uh, who is, remember, very anxious. So you are, in a way, trying to control the anxiety of the patient. And CISA success means that we will not have to interrupt the treatment to give additional supplementary anesthesia because the patient is experiencing pain. If we want to treat an emergency treatment, if we, sorry, if we do an emergency treatment for a symptomatic irreversible palpitis, if at some point during the procedure we have to stop and give an, a, a, an interligamentary anesthesia, for example, that means we have failed because we are subjecting the patient to unnecessary pain. Uh, anesthesia success also means that we will not give an intrapulpal injection to be able to complete the procedure. So anesthesia success means no pain at all from needle insertion to the completion of the treatment. And this can be done in every case. And this is what I'm going to discuss today. Successful anesthesia of mandibular molars with symptomatic irreversible palpitis in every case. No pain at all from A to Z of the procedure. Now, when I, uh, when I present the, uh, the, the, the approach uh, that I will describe of the uh, uh, anesthesia, I will be talking about uh, cold pulp testing. Uh, so I will use <clears throat> in my approach the endo ice. The endo ice gives a temperature of around minus, <clears throat> excuse me, minus 20, 26, uh, minus 30 degrees Celsius, minus, so very cold. And in the description later, I will speak about the gradual pulp testing. And this is extremely important to understand if we want to be able to achieve pulpal anesthesia in every case in a molar that is presenting with symptomatic irreversible palpitis. And if we want to do this without any pain at all to the patient. I will also speak about supplemental anesthesia. One of them is the periodontal ligament injection. So the periodontal ligament injection, as you all know, we uh, inject in the periodontal ligament, as you see on the uh, left uh, picture and the second picture. The third picture shows, I just wanted to show you uh, the ultra short 27 gauge needle, which you can be very, helpful for the intrapulpal anesthesia because it is a rigid needle. If we use uh, other needles, 31 gauge needles, these sometimes can break. The picture on the right is not a periodontal ligament injection. It is in a way a, uh, an intraosseous injection, but without perforating the cortical bone. So you, we would just push the needle through the tissues until we have uh, contact with the bone. A supplemental anesthesia is also a retromolar injection. I did not know about the presence of retromolar foramen and the retromolar canal until a few years ago when I was looking for references uh, you know, to, to prepare a lecture like this one. So what we can do, we can give a retromolar injection. It doesn't, you don't have to look for the retromolar foramen. 
So the retromolar foramen uh, is connected to the inferior alveolar nerve through the retromolar canal. So an anesthesia at this level may affect the anesthesia of the, in, the, of the inferior alveolar nerve, but you do not really have to look for it. I personally do a retromolar injection just behind on the distal of the very last molar. I will do it as an intraligamentary uh, injection. And there is also the intraosseous injection, uh, which is considered as a supplemental uh, uh, anesthesia. Uh, and here I'm going to show you a video prepared by Stefan Simon on the x -tip. So in the intraosseous injection, we have to perforate the cortical bone, and then we will place a guide in the perforation in order to inject the uh, anesthetic solution. So here the uh, soft tissues are disinfected with iodine. This is a soft tissue anesthesia in order to be able to drill through the soft tissue and into the cortical bone to do the intraosseous injection. So this is the X tip. So the X tip is mounted on a contraangle. And then the red block is removed. That is a pro protective block. And then after evaluating the radiograph, you choose a, an, a, a, a perforation site. And we perforate the soft tissue and the bone and the cortical bone. Then the sleeve is, the, the needle is removed and the sleeve, the guide is kept. And this is what we will have. Then we inject into the guide, through the guide into the cortical bone. I do not do this technique here, but I wanted to show this video uh, to be able to give you my opinion about intraosseous techniques. I do not do it. And I will not speak about it later in my approach because I think, I really think this is in a way a, a brutal technique. I personally do not want to have the soft tissues and the cortical bone drilled uh, while I'm awake. Uh, I've had it once. Uh, the sensation is not pleasant at all. Also, this technique can be associated uh, with a uh, uh, damage to the roots. So when we do the intraosseous injection technique, as I said, we have to perforate the cortical bones. So we have to be careful where we choose the site of, of perforation. And no matter how experienced you are, there is always a risk and we are always anxious about causing a damage. What you should also know about the intraosseous techniques is that all of the articles have shown that 50%, even a little bit more, of the patients to whom we do an intraosseous injection will experience mild to severe pain during the drilling, the perforation procedure, and also during the injection of the anesthetic. And this is something you have to be aware of because if we are doing the intraosseous injection technique as a supplemental technique, we might cause pain. If we cause pain, I'll bring you back to the anxiety of the patient the patient will react in a 
will 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 experience probably more pain, and they will the the patients will be more sensitive to pain, and we are going to create a vicious circle, more anxiety, more fear, more pain. So for all of these reasons, I do not do the intraosseous injection technique. And I'll show you here the approach that I follow, and you will see that I do not need to do an intraosseous injection technique in order to obtain a successful uh, palpable anesthesia. The first step in my approach is communication. Communication because we want to control the anxiety of the patient. Again, remember, these are patients who are already anxious because they are going to a dentist's office. They are in severe pain because they have a molar with a symptomatic irreversible pul pul pulpitis, which usually uh, presents with acute symptoms. So communication is very important. And by communication, I mean we have to explain to the patient the procedure. We have to tell first the patient that this is what we call a hot tooth, which means this tooth here will require more time than usual in order to anesthetize it. We should not tell the patient that this is a hot tooth and it may be difficult to achieve anesthesia. That is a negative connotation. So we try to be positive. And believe me, from my experience, 30 years of experience, the control of the anxiety is extremely important. So I will tell the patient that I will require more time, and I do require more time because this is, you know, uh, these are cases with acute inflammation. And I explain to the patient about every step. The first step is the needle penetration. And the patient, you know, it will be great if we assure the patient, patient that there will, no, there will be no pain at all during the needle penetration. Now, there are many ways to insert the needle with, uh, with the least amount of pain. What I personally do, I use a technique that was taught uh, to me by Pierre Mastou. This is probably one of the best things that Pierre Mastou has taught me. So I use a gauze in order to hold the cheek of the patient, as you see in the picture, Usually I would hold it with my thumb from the inside. I put pressure on the soft tissues and I pull the cheek. When I do that, pressure and pulling, I insert the needle. By doing this, we are activating what we call the gate control theory, which means by doing this, we are activating uh, the touch and the pressure nerve fibers. And according to the gate control theory, when these nerve fibers, the touch and pressure nerve fibers are activated, they inhibit the pain fibers. So pain transmission does not happen. And believe me, if you do it, you will see that the patients will be extremely surprised that they did not feel anything uh, to the needle penetration. Don't forget, you put pressure with the gauze, you have to use a gauze in order to be able to pull the cheek, uh, to pull the cheek when you want to insert. If you don't use a gauze with the saliva in the mouth of the patient, your fingers will slip and you will not be able to pull the cheek well. This is how I do. And I do not, I never use topical anesthetics. I do not use any other technique, only this. So I explain to the patient that they will not feel any pain at all during the needle insertion. And this is already something that is reassuring to the patient. So I started telling them that, I started by promising them that they will not feel any pain. I promise them. Then I tell them there will not be any discomfort to the insertion. I tell them there will not be any discomfort 
uh, while I give the uh, while while I ad administer the anesthetic, and therefore when I do the injection, I do it very slowly. It takes me between one minute to one and a half minutes, very slowly. It, and when I do it that slowly, I'm also able to aspirate very frequently. We have to aspirate when we do an inferior alveolar nerve block, just to avoid an intravascular injection. So imagine you, 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 you uh, insert the needle, you inject, and you're doing an intravascular injection. The patient will have heart palpit, uh, palpitation. Uh, some may feel dizzy. And again, this will make the patient more anxious. And we will break the trust of the patient. The patient will be more sensitive to pain. And that means we will have a higher chance that the palpable anesthesia will not work. So all of these details will affect the, the mental status of the patient. They are extremely important with respect to pain. We always should start with uh, two blocks, two carcules. So I do two uh, inferior alveolar nerve blocks. For those who are uh, French speaking, uh, we call this l'anesthésie tronculaire alipine de speaks. So we do, we give two carcules, again, while uh, stretching. And we tell the patient, you know, after the first carpal, we will tell them that we are going to do two carpals. Why two carpals? Because there are studies that have shown that with two carpals, we will have a higher success rate of pulp and incisa in mandibular molars uh, that are presenting with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Then we wait 15 minutes. Why 15 minutes? Because studies have shown that we need at least 10 minutes before the pulp is completely anesthetized. So if you are uh, a uh, dentist working in, uh, you know, in a clinic where you have three, four dental chairs, uh, while you know, waiting 10, 15 minutes, you can do a consultation, with, you can do something else. So myself in my office, I would, do two calculus, then I will go to see other patient for a consultation. So we wait 15 minutes, and then uh, we will look for lip numbness. So lip numbness means that the technique was successful. That means you uh, inserted the needle where it should be inserted. I'm not going to discuss this today, uh, but you can find, you know, in any textbook, how to do the uh, inferior alveolar nerve block, you should have lip numbness. If you do not have lip numbness after 15 minutes, that means you have to redo the injection in a correct way in order to get lip numbness. So once you have lip numbness, you will do the gradual called pulp testing. So many authors, many endodontists, and maybe also many dentists, they use a cold test in order to see if the pulp is anesthetized. So they do a cold test if the tooth does not respond. If there's a negative response, we assume that the pulp is completely anesthetized. And this is what is described in every article that is published on this topic, even in articles published in peer-reviewed endontic journals. And this is a very big mistake. When we do a cold pulp test using endo ice, as I said earlier, the endo ice gives a temperature of minus 25 to minus 30 degrees. So what we do, 
we spray on the cotton pellet and we apply the cotton pellet on normally the buccal surface of the mandibular molar. This can cause severe pain. If you haven't, if you do not know this, try to do a cold test yourself. Spray and apply the cotton pellet. That will cause severe pain. So if you want to assess if the pulp was anesthetized by doing a cold pulp test, and if we do the cold pulp test in this manner, you will cause severe pain if the pulp is not uh, anesthetized. Severe pain means anxiety, and again, the vicious circle, anxiety, pain, anxiety, pain. And this is why I developed what I call the gradual cold pulp testing. Before actually, before I continue with this, I have to also say that in the articles, every article that is published, they do the cold pulp test on only one surface, and usually it is the buccal surface. With the gradual cold pulp testing, we will do the cold test on three surfaces if possible, the buccal, the occlusal, and the lingual. But we will not do the cold test as it is described in the articles. I'm not going to spray and apply the cotton pellet on the tooth because I'd want to avoid eliciting severe pain if the pulp is not well anesthetized. So what I do, and this is, this is the key to successful pulp anesthesia in every case. I would spray on the cotton pellet, the end device. I wait a few seconds until it's not very cold, and then I apply it on the buccal surface, but I do not apply it with pressure. I barely touch the tooth and quickly then remove the, remove the uh, cotton pellet. Before doing this, I explain to the patient that I'm going to do a test to see how the tooth feels, and I assure the patient that there will not be any pain. And I explained to the patient that if they feel cold, we will have to give more anesthesia. And if after this testing, they do not feel anything at all, no cold, then we know that we can proceed uh, with the procedure. So I spray, wait a few seconds, put it on the buccal surface just quickly and then take it out. If the patient tells you, I felt something, it won't be pain. If you do it in this manner, it won't be pain. If the patient tells you, I felt something, then you know that the pulp is not uh, completely anesthetized. If the patient does not feel anything to this first test, then I would spray again on the cotton pellet, but this time I would apply it quicker on the tooth surface for a little bit longer time, but not with a lot of pressure. And I keep doing this, increasing you know, uh, the time I keep the cotton pellet on the tooth surface. If the patient does not feel anything on the buccal surface, after doing a few tests gradually, then I do the test on the occlusal surface. I will do it in the same manner, and then on the lingual surface in the same manner. And this is why it will take time. But again, don't forget, what we want to do is to anesthetize the tooth without causing any pain. We want the patient to uh, not have an unpleasant experience. So once we do the gradual pulp testing on the three surfaces, if there is no feeling, then you are sure that the pulp and anesthesia was successful. I do not have any studies published. I have more than 25 years of experience doing this. And when you try it, you will see that I am correct. And there is no harm in trying it because no matter what you do, if you do this, it will be better than 
you know the the what we used to do the the conventional approach and i want to remind you that all of the studies used to do they still do only one test quickly on a buccal surface and that is it causing pain if the pulp is not anesthetized pain anxiety anxiety pain vicious circle now if the patient tells you they feel something cold and again if you do it gradually as i said they will not feel pain they will feel cold like when uh, actually i tell my patients i tell them it will be cold you might feel something cold like similar to when you eat an ice cream so if they feel something and then you do the supplemental anesthesia and supplemental anesthesia again means uh, uh, periodontal ligament anesthesia injection not the intraosseous injection not the intraosseous injection because i think it is traumatic to the patient it is traumatic to the dentist because there is still some anxiety that we may damage something uh, and more than 50 percent of the patients will feel mild to severe pain during the perforation of the bone and during the injection which means more anxiety so it's always it will always be a uh, periodontal ligament injection you do the periodont and i would explain to the patient again i i kept this picture here of the assistant or the doctor and the patient because communication with the patient is important at every step so if the patient feels something after the gradual pulp testing we will have to do the intra we have to do the, the uh, supplemental anesthesia the uh, periodontal ligament injection so we have to tell the patient that now we're doing we're going to do some injections around the tooth so you do a periodontal ligament injection on the uh, distal side and the lingual side you can give between uh, uh, half of the carpule to one carpule on each side and when you do that oops sorry oh, i apologize And after you do the uh, periodontal injection, you wait two minutes. You can even wait only one minute. Uh, we know from studies that the periodontal ligament injection, the onset of the anesthesia after a periodontal ligament injection takes around one minute. So we wait one, two minutes, and then we repeat the gradual pulp testing, cold pulp testing on the three surfaces if you want to make sure that the tooth is successfully anesthetized you have to do it on the three surfaces and you have to do it gradually this will take time i can tell you this will take time sometimes it takes me up to 30 minutes to anesthetize the tooth but the patient is not feeling any pain so it is a win-win situation the patient is happy i am happy my staff is happy because there is no stress. And then the referring dentist for me as an endodontist is happy. So I keep doing this. We do the, cold, the, gradual, pulp, uh, the gradual cold pulp testing. If the patient feels again something, we repeat the uh, periodontal ligament injection. And you know, there is, a maximum of uh, a maximum volume of anesthetic that we should not uh, exceed i'm not going to discuss this right now but if you uh, if you do not know how to calculate that please email me i'll have my email at the end email me and i will send you a uh, a chart about how to determine the maximum uh, volume of anesthetic that can be used for each patient so usually you will have uh, a confirmation of pulp anesthesia by the gradual cold pulp testing by doing a, uh, two to three series of supplemental anesthesia. And the pulp will be completely anesthetized. And then 
you can start the root canal procedure and the patient will not feel any pain at all. You will not have to stop in order to give more anesthesia. You will not have to stop and give an intrapulpal anesthesia. It takes time. It can take time, but it guarantees successful pulpal anesthesia in mandibular molars with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis in every case. And this is what I have been doing for the past 25 years. So that was a description of the approach. This is what I do. Now there is a second part to this lecture here, which is also related to pulp anesthesia and, and, and symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Now this is uh, a picture from Beirut uh, during uh, the war. And you may wonder why I put this picture here. Especially if I put under, under it, you know, a reference about uh, the use of corticosteroids to, uh, to manage endodontic pain. So I put this picture because what I'm going to speak about right now is something that I developed actually during the war in Lebanon in the late 1980s. Uh, one of my friends, a dentist, it was wartime. So uh, he uh, called me, told me he has a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. It was wartime, so we couldn't go anywhere. I knew by that time, I, I was aware of the use of corticosteroids and mainly dexamethasone in endodontics and oral surgery uh, to control pain. And, you know, out of any options, I told him, you know, take dexamethasone, uh, high dose, because articles show that a high dose for one day of dexamethasone can relieve pain quite significantly. And he did that. He was relieved of pain. He was completely relieved of pain, pain associated with uh, a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. So within three hours, he was completely relieved. And that gave me an idea. Uh, I thought, you know, if he was relieved just by dexamethasone, that is great. But it took three hours for the uh, pain relief to be complete. So I thought, hmm, why not then uh, for these cases, why not uh, prescribe dexamethasone? And also before letting the patient go, uh, do an inferior alveolar nerve block, two carpules, uh, uh, 2% lidocaine with one over 100,000 uh, epinephrine. That was at that time, because at that time, uh, this is all you know, what we had for anesthetics in a way, like the regular, the short acting anesthetics. So this is why I put this picture here. The idea of combining uh, anesthesia, dental anesthesia and dexamethasone to relieve an, an emergency that is caused by a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis arise since then. And now I'm going to describe to you uh, this uh, topic here, the emergency treatment of sym symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. I presented this at the Congress of the American Association of Endodontists in 2018. And that was the actual title of my lecture, Emergency Treatment of Symptomatic Irreversible Pulpitis with one carpule of bupivacaine, which is a long-acting long anesthetic. So uh, it's like marcaine. In the 1980s, we didn't have it in Lebanon. And I'm not sure it was marcaine was available um, at that time. This is why I used, I used to use then uh, lidocaine. So emergency treatment of uh, acute pulpitis with one carpule of of bupivacaine, long acting anesthetic, and one day high dose oral dexamethasone. And that is it. Without a pulpotomy or a pulpectomy. And this is something 
I used very frequently when I was practicing in, uh, in Toronto. I was working five days a week from nine to five, fully booked. I didn't have time to see patients for emergencies. And if a patient presents with an emergency, we are obliged to relieve them. We have an obligation to do that. And if the dentist sends, referred to me a patient in emergency, you know, I wanted to make the dentist happy by servicing you know, his patient. So I didn't have the time to do a palpectomy or a palpotomy. I was working from nine to five nonstop every day. And this is where I put this approach uh, to use. And it is a very successful approach to treat such emergencies without spending time on a palpotomy or a palpectomy. And believe me, it works very well. Every case presenting with an irreversible palpitus, an acute irreversible palpitus, the pain can be relieved almost immediately. And I'll describe to you how we can do that. But again, the most important step is communication because the patient is coming, you know, the patient has been referred to me to treat the, the, the emergency, to do an emergency treatment. So they, the patients uh, will expect to have some type of a treatment done. And I'm not going to do any treatment. I'm not going to do a palpectomy. I'm not going to do a palpotomy. I'm just going to prescribe the examinator and do an inferior alveolar nerve block. So I tell them what I will do. And I will reassure them that when they leave the office, they will be out of pain and they will be free of pain for at least seven, 10 days. So, you know, there are studies that have shown that uh, dexamethasone <clears throat> will, uh, will affect, will, will, will uh, decrease the concentration of the inflammatory mediators in the pulp. So the inflammation will be decreased in the pulp when we give dexamethasone. And therefore, it, you know, it, uh, it seems logic to assume that the examinosome will help relieving pain. So basically what I do, I speak with the patient, I tell them what we're going to do, and then I give only one calcul of bupivacaine uh, in the block, so for, the, for an inferior Alveolar, alveolar nerve block. And as soon as I give the anesthesia, I give them a prescription of dexamethasone. Actually, I give them the, the tablets in the office. I give them three milligrams of dexamethasone as soon as I finish with the anesthesia. And I give them tablets to take every four hours for one day. The combination of the long-acting anesthesia and the dexamethasone will relieve the pain for a long time. And believe me if I tell you, I have patients who did not return for the root canal procedure because they had long-term pain, pain relief. And there are studies that have shown that a high dose of dexamethasone and one day is very safe. Actually, this is not high. You know, in medicine, a high dose of dexamethasone in one day is around 50 milligrams to 60 milligrams. So this is in a way low dose, but in dentistry, this is considered as a, as a high dose. And that has been shown to be very safe. And that has been shown not to cause any infections in case, for example, there was uh, a dormant infection uh, in the mouth, for example, in a, a, a necrotic tooth. So this is a very effective technique 
to manage an emergency that is associated with, an, with a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. However, this technique has limitations which are associated with the contraindications to the use of dexamethasone. And this is an issue because dexamethasone has many contraindications and these are the most important ones. Systemic fungal infections, allergy, hypersensitivity, tuberculosis, peptic ulcers, and immune, some immune diseases like the Guillain-Barré syndrome. The Guillain-Barré syndrome is an immune disease that uh, uh, affects uh, the nerves in, in our body. So right now, not right now, for many years now, I have not done a palpectomy or a palpotomy uh, to treat uh, to, to, for an emergency treatment of an acute irreversible pulpitis, unless I have time. If I have time, then I would do the whole procedure. And this is something you can use in case uh, you know you do not have time to uh, to see a patient in emergency, or in case you do not want to deal with the management of anesthesia uh, for a patient, you know, who is anxious and presenting with uh, a symptomatic acute uh, pulpitis, a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. If you follow this approach here, the examethasone, if you can, if there are no contraindications, uh, if you follow this uh, approach, so, a long-acting anesthetic, one carpule, and dexamethasone for one day. The patient, when they come, when they come back to you, they will be asymptomatic. And if they are asymptomatic, that means the chances of successful pulp anesthesia next time they see you will be much higher. And that is according to studies. So studies have shown that when there are no symptoms of an acute erosive pulpitis, the success rate is much higher. And then the pulp anesthesia will be easier to accomplish. And with this slide here, I finish my, uh, my presentation and I will take any questions uh, if you want right now. For those who do not want to ask questions now, or if they have questions later, they can email me. This is my email here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your valuable presentation and all the tips and hints that you gave us. Just one small question about the, the needle type. When you said the patient is anxious and you will do the injection without any pain, you tell them there is no pain. Uh, what will be the diameter of the needle? And if there's any specific uh, anesthetic. At, at the end, you mentioned lidocaine and bupivacaine. In normal cases, it will be like this for the inferior nerve block. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so uh, for, uh, for the needle, I use uh, a 31 gauge needle. So uh, it's a uh, long needle, uh, quite flexible. Um, I don't think the needle diameter will matter that much. Okay, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to use, you know, a very rigid needle. Um, so a 31 gauge needle will be, works very, very well as long as, you know, as I said, we stretch the cheek while putting pressure yes. close to the injection site. Now, with respect to the anesthetic type, I do not think that the anesthetic type is important. And actually, I say this based on studies that have been published. There are studies that have used lidocaine, some have used articaine, some have used other um, anesthetic solutions. And all of these solutions, in a way, when we took all of the studies at the same time, all of these solutions 
provides any way a similar success rate or failure rate for mandibular molars with, with uh, a symptomatic irreversible uh, palpitis. Even for the interligamentary injection, even for the periodontal ligament injection, whether we use this, this type of anesthetic or the other type of anesthetic, the success rate will not really change. What matters is that we follow what I described in order to be able to, uh, to, uh, to obtain successful pulp anesthesia. Now, if a dentist is more comfortable, for example, using a 4% uh, anesthetic solution, it doesn't matter. They can use 4% or they can use 2% with or without epinephrine. What matters is that mm -hmm. they follow the procedure as, as I described, and mainly the gradual pulp testing and repeating this until uh, there will be pulp anesthesia. So whether with this anesthetic or that anesthetic, the result at the end will be, will be the same. I have a question, Professor Yared. Uh, do you do systematically two cartridges, uh, even if the condition, refer the referral uh, patient has only uh, non-irreversible, acute irreversible pulpitis? or you only in conditions of irreversible palpitis, you do two uh, cartridges? No, I personally do two, two, two cartridges in every case, in every case. Um, I actually published a study many, many, many years ago where I compared one to two uh, cartridges and I showed them that uh, one cartridge, uh, two cartridges are, will give us a higher chance of successful uh, uh, anesthesia in teeth that have a, uh, a healthy pulp. Even in healthy pulps. Yes. My other question will be, if you have periodontal disease, your injection in the distal uh, pocket or in the distal region, normally the intraligamentary is contraindicated when there is a periodontal disease because of the uh, postoperative uh, uh, conditions that could uh, follow and the uh, bacteria. So what do you do when there is a uh, periodontal uh, endoperior lesion or periodontal uh, disease? Yeah, thanks very much for asking this question. I, uh, I should have uh, discussed it. Um, so if there is periodontal disease, well, there are different ways. We can do uh, a, uh, an interligamental injection, a retromolar interligamental injection that can help. And we can do, if you remember on one of the slides, when I showed the uh, periodontal ligament injection, I, throw, I showed three pictures. One of them, I said, this is not a, uh, a periodontal injection. This is an injection that is done, you know, uh, it, it is a modification of an intraosseous uh, injection yeah. Where, yeah. where the uh, needle is inserted through the soft tissues uh, until it comes in contact with the uh, cortical bone. And actually I would, I would force it a little bit just in case I can get through the cortical bone because sometimes it can go through the cortical bone if you put pressure, as long as you have a, uh, a, a rigid needle. So I would choose a site around that tooth where I'm in a way away from the, uh, from the periodontal disease. So, so this is also in, to replace the uh, uh, buccal injection, additional buccal injection. So you do it like in half. Uh, half yes, of, yeah, exactly, the, exactly. It will yes. replace the buccal that we are doing because yes. of the thickness of uh, the gum uh, that we can get the uh, osseous uh, bone uh, contact easier. Yes, yes, exactly. And it, it many times I don't actually do the the. Uh, the uh, typical uh, periodontal injection. I just do uh, the injection, you know, on the buccal side or even on the on the uh, on the lingual side. So if there is periodontal disease, I I try to to uh, stay away from it. Avoid it. And what about the pregnant women and the indication for articaine in that particular case, and uh, also the diabetes that contraindicates the corticosteroids so that you are also in the conditions of contraindications. Yes, yes, it means, 
there are contraindications we have to uh, we have to follow. So, like for yeah. example, for the dexamethasone, zone, there are many contraindications. If there is a contraindication to the use of dexamethasone zone or to a specific anesthetic because of a specific condition, I have to to uh, to change my approach. So, if I if I have a patient who is having a symptomatic reversal palpitis coming in emergency, and I know that uh, dexamethasone zone is contraindicated to them, then that approach is out of the question. Uh, this is uh, a limitation to, uh, to the technique. And unfortunately, these days, these days, you know, many patients probably would present with, uh, with a contraindication to the use of uh, the examiner zone, then uh, will be forced to uh, do the palpectomy or the palpotomy. Yeah. And do you prescribe any uh, AI and uh, S? Uh, just my last question: AI and S before the treatment. So do, do I prescribe uh, anti-inflammatory drugs? No, 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 no. no. Oh, thank no. you. There are thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. There is one Questions. colleague, uh, yes. Professor. Uh, he wants he wants to ask. Uh, what, why patient feel severe pain in case of sodium hypochlorite accident uh, if he's already anesthetized? That is a good question. Uh, you know, the, when we do anesthesia, in my opinion, I, this is a good question. When we do anesthesia, there, are, there will always be some nerve fibers that are not uh, well anesthetized. Uh, when we have a sodium hypochlorite accident, the sodium hypochlorite is usually injected under pressure. Uh, and so it happens, the sodium hypochlorite accident happens when the needle is blocked in the canal and then we inject. We think this may not be a great issue, but we are injecting a big amount of sodium hypochlorite out of the, out of the, uh, out of the tooth. And if there are any nerve fibers that are not uh, anesthetized, which is possible, and we know this, for example, when we do surgery, sometimes no matter what we do, there will still be some areas in the bone that are not uh, well anesthetized. So if this is the case, the patient will, see, will, will experience severe pain. Mm -hmm. Another one, after two carpool of anesthesia, after anxiety control, will PDL injection not be painful? If needed after gradual pulp test, it is known to be painful. No, no, it won't be painful. When, so when we, when we give, when we administer two cartridges of uh, anesthetic uh, for an inferior alveolar nerve block, uh, we wait until the patient's uh, lip is numb. This is essential. When the patient's lip is numb, that means the soft tissues in that area and the bone uh, on the same side is well, are well anesthetized, but that does not mean that the pulp is well anesthetized. In, in dental anesthesia, the pulp is the most difficult tissue to anesthetize because, uh, because it in a way it is the furthest away from the anesthetic solution. So when we have pulp, when we have lip numbness, the soft tissues are very well anesthetized and the bone is well anesthetized superficially. And then the interligamentary or the periodontal ligament injection will not be painful at all. We have to warn, we have to, to warn the patient. And so thanks for this question. We have to warn the patient that when we do the periodontal periodontal uh, injection, periodontal ligament injection, there will be some pressure. The patient will feel pressure. And the periodontal ligament injection will not be successful unless we, unless there is a resistance, you know, to the injection. If we inject and the solution flows back, it will not be successful. So we have to be, uh, we have to inject with pressure and we should not see the solution flowing back. And this is why we feel the resistance to pressure. And you do it mesial or furcal or, or both? I do it mesial, distal, furcal on the buccal uh, oh. and even on the lingual. And when I say mesial and distal, I do it uh, mesial, uh, mesial buccal, yeah, mesial uh, mesial buccal or 
this tobacco or mesolingual or this tolingual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? I have a question. Uh, I mean, uh, if you have a case of uh, apical periodontitis with swelling, do you apply exactly the same protocol for the to? Uh, I know it's it's all out of topic because you are talking no, about no, reversible yeah. pulpitis, yeah. but uh, do you apply exactly the same protocol for your anesthesia? I do that, and I have done that. Uh, I didn't do that on as many cases as I did with uh, uh, acute pulpitis, but I did it on teeth that have presented with an acute apical abscess, and there are no issues at all. And there are actually studies that have shown that, that the administration of dexamethasone in, uh, in the presence of infection will not be a problem. And this is something that is done quite frequently in, in dental surgery, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one more question. If you are working on uh, number five, number four, number three with acute reversal pulpitis, I usually do a block also. Do you do blocks or do you do a, a bantal anesthesia or periapical anesthesia in these cases? No, for premolars, I also do blocks. Um, and actually, I prefer to do blocks for every tooth, like uh, every mandibular or, tooth. Or lower. And... Yes. Uh, However, sometimes, you know, when I think about it, for, for example, a, a, a central incisor, a mandibular central incisor, which, which is quite easy to, uh, to anesthetize, yeah. uh, it's not easy to convince myself to do a block. Although the block, I like, like it because it will help me also uh, with some patients when I take a radiograph. So placing the radiograph uh, on the lingual can be yeah. uh, quite challenging Unfold. for some patients. So uh, that's why I prefer to do a block whenever you know I feel it's, it's, it's somewhat all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Professor Ziarit, for your uh, for your time and for your tips and making uh, things easy. And uh, I will remind uh, our colleagues behind uh, Dr. Carla, 3, 4 June, 2022, <laughs> remember our Congress. And uh, our next webinar will be on the 9th of uh, May with uh, Professor Ribera about uh, gentle wave. And we will keep you posted. Thank, Thank you very much, everyone. And please don't hesitate to email me with any questions that you have. And uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you.